Hello and welcome to the discussion. This channel is here to serve as a platform for scholarly discussions about some of the most significant questions regarding the historical Jesus, Christian origins, the philosophy of religion, and thoughtful theology. My name is Nahoa. I'm here to ask those questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. Here's something you probably don't acknowledge enough. Jesus was Jewish. He just was. He was a Jewish man from a Jewish family in a rural Jewish town with teachings rooted in Jewish tradition, drawing from Jewish scriptures. Christians call him Christ, which means Messiah, and Messiah is itself a Jewish concept. But what does it mean to be the Messiah? What kind of person were many ancient Jews, that is, Jews from Jesus' time, expecting? And this is an important question, especially because Christians don't usually just say Jesus is the Messiah. They also tend to worship him as God. Is that even a coherent conjunct, a divine father and a divine Messiah as the one God? Did that notion originate with Christians, or are there earlier non-Christian Jewish precedents for that? Moreover, considering how deeply steeped Jesus was in Judaism, what was his relationship to the Torah, to, to the Hebrew scriptures, or what many Christians would call the Old Testament? Did he relax a number of the commandments? Did he maintain them all conservatively? Or is the truth maybe a bit more nuanced? These are some of the questions we'll get into today. The scholar joining and teaching us has studied at Goddard College, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Columbia University. He's currently a professor at UC Berkeley and an expert on Hebrew literature, Semitic languages, Talmudic culture, and the relationship between what we call Christianity and what we call Judaism. I was first introduced to him through his book, The Jewish Gospels, The Story of the Jewish Christ. It was a fascinating read and it serves as the foundation for a lot of what we'll talk about today. So I strongly recommend that book and I greatly respect the author. So without further introduction, Dr. Daniel Boyarin, how are you? I'm well, and I'm glad to be here. So um, um, my introduction to you has been through your questions and suggestions. And uh, I must say that I have been very, very impressed at how young a person um, you are <laughs> and how much sophistication and uh, critical nuance you show in your thinking and questioning. And I think that's what really attracted me to joining you on this, uh, on this adventure today. So it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you too. And I really appreciate that. I'm honored to have you on and excited to ask you some of those questions. Uh, just to begin as a preliminary, but an important one, could you please introduce our audience to the ancient Jewish belief in two sovereignties and explain the key pieces of evidence which show that this was, in fact, an established, although, of course, not universal view? Right. Okay. Um, basically, um, I have argued, and uh, a lot of people agree with me, and a lot of people disagree, so uh, there's nothing absolutely certain about anything, but uh, that there is ample evidence that even before Jesus was born, that is even before the Christian event, the Christ event, there were significant numbers of the people we call Jews around the Mediterranean who believed in worshipped even a two-person God, not three, but two. In other words, that the notion of a God who had uh, characteristics of an old, an old, an old guy, an old guy God, and a young uh, God were uh, more than characteristics, who really had two person persons, two personalities, although systematic theology hadn't really been invented yet, uh, was a very common uh, Jewish belief. Um, I'm not going to cite all the evidence, but just 
one piece of evidence that I think is key is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where uh, there is a vision of heaven and the prophet Daniel sees a, um, a two uh, thrones in heaven. On one is, is sitting an ancient of days with a white beard, you know, the, that our image of God the Father, and in the, the other comes and joins um, the Ancient of Days, a young, a God like a young man. Um, so uh, or a divine figure like a young man. And that to me, that has of course served uh, Christian think, thinkers as evidence of the Father and the Son, and I think that uh, it is not inapposite, particularly if we add the other evidence, to imagine that uh, many, many uh, Jews had this dual image of an old, wise, judge-type God and a young more or, more or less activist or even warrior uh, God uh, together. So that's that's the basic the basic idea. Now the reason the book is called the Jewish Christ and not Jesus the Jew, there are other books that are called Jesus the Jew, is because I'm I'm going beyond the notion that Jesus was a Jew which is, by the way, held by many people by now. Um, many uh, devout Christians recognize uh, uh, Jesus as a Jew. I once saw a, um, a, um, a, a bumper sticker in Brooklyn that said, um, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. Mm -hmm. um, and it was quite clear uh, of whom that bumper sticker was uh, speaking. There may have even been as a cross or something um, on it. But, uh, but I went beyond that in my book and have suggested that some of the fundamental ideas of Christology, of uh, interpretations of the Christ event or the expectations uh, that uh, gave rise to the acceptance of Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah are also founded in such uh, Jewish images um, and concepts as what I've just outlined. Thank you for that. And another important text you point to in your book is First Enoch, which is roughly contemporaneous with the Gospels from the mid-first century, or at least... Um, Part, a part of it is, and it, it, in it we read about the Son of Man, and it's not just one like a Son of Man anymore, it's actually a title for an eschatological figure, and right. he is exalted, it seems like he's exalted to divine status, he is uh, worshipped as God, he, see, of course, you know, the Son of Man is drawing from that text in Daniel 7 that you mentioned, so maybe could you talk a little bit about the evidence in First Enoch? Uh, yeah, uh, just a little bit, though. Um, it, first Enoch, the material in, in the book of Enoch, uh, and especially in a section called the parables of Enoch, right, um, uh, is very explicit about there being a figure in heaven who is a divinized human, right? A human who has become God, as it were. Um, initially, Enoch the patriarch, who then becomes uh, divinized and is referred to as the son of man. Uh, now, uh, this suggests to me, now this is not the origin of the gospel, nor is it dependent on the gospel, because of course in the gospel, Jesus is the son of man, not Enoch, right? So these are two separate 
testimonies to the concept and the term, the title Son of Man, as a um, as an as you say an eschatological figure, a redeemer, who is some kind of a confluence of God and human. Right Now, as I said, systematic theology had not yet been invented. Christology had not yet been elaborated, so it wasn't a question. One, one nature, two natures, uh, uh, you know, uh, homoousius, homoousius, all of the things that would trouble Christian thinkers in the third and, and following centuries. Uh, about the theory of this, but the basic notion of a God-man redeemer uh, was uh, on this evidence as well, uh, current um, uh, among Jews. Now you said quite rightly that uh, we ought not to see it as universal. We, we really have no idea. But uh, what we do have is sufficient evidence that there were Jews who um, were expecting a divine human redeemer. Mm. Right? So on the one hand, we've got the Father and the Son. And on the other hand, we've got something like the Incarnation. Right? Thank you. Now, now, as a potential objection, or really just, just an interesting question, um, I've come across the Jewish concept of a shaliach, an agent who acts on behalf of a sender, maintaining the sender's authority and identity in fulfilling a mission. To my knowledge, the earliest example is in Genesis 24, where Abraham sends his oldest servant to take a wife for Isaac. Here the servant right. is sent as a representative of Isaac, acting as and for him. A more striking example is in Exodus 7, where God said to Moses, I have made you God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. Here, Moses yeah. represents God to Pharaoh, speaking as and for God. Even in the New Testament, Jesus sends each apostle in Greek, or really shaliach in the original Aramaic, to preach and heal. Jesus says, quote, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. But the one who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. That's in Luke 10, 16. So right. it seems that this concept may offer another lens through which to interpret the second God figure. On this interpretation, for example, the, the angel of the Lord is not God, but the shaliach of God. Similarly, the eschatological son of man wouldn't be seen as God, but as the shaliach of God. Thus, according to this view, Early Jewish Christians didn't understand Jesus to be a second God, but rather a shaliach or agent of God, having been granted God's authority, yet remaining very distinct and subordinate in nature. So I was wondering if you could shed some light on that. Well, yeah, but, it, uh, but I don't have any particular problem with that. Remember, there were uh, versions of early Christology that were afterwards, but only afterwards, declared heretical. In which, in which Jesus, the you know the incarnate or the second person, to put it uh, more technically, the Son, what was himself not quite God, but uh, but a shaliach of God. I mean, uh, that's uh, the uh, putting it crudely or putting it in a, in a very um, sharp and unnuanced way. That was, in a sense, the doctrine of the Christians who were called Arians, which has nothing to do with Aryan in the, mo you know, the modern sense of Germans right. or people from India, it's, uh, followers of Arius. Uh, and the great uh, fourth century controversy, the Aryan controversy, uh, was, was over this very question, right? So I wouldn't be uh, shocked or disturbed to uh, imagine that that was the um, that that was the earliest uh, notion of the second divine figure, right? But there's a, there is still a difference between a second divine figure 
and um, a, 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 who functions as a shaliach, right? Because shaliach is a function; it's not a uh, it's not a theological status, right? Um, and uh, let's say a, a human uh, agent, a human shaliach, that and. Uh, 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 as I as I mentioned before, I think there is quite a bit of evidence that um, is quite a bit of evidence that this uh, the second person, to use anachronistic terminology, was already was regarded as divine already in in pre Christian antiquity by at least some Jews, I'm not, again, I'm not claiming by all, but uh, by at least some Jews, preparing the way, as it were, right? Like John the Baptist was preparing the way, so these ideas were preparing the way also. Um, that's one point. Secondly, there is evidence, although not a great deal, that uh, Jews, uh, worshipped the second person. There is some evidence that uh, Jews worshipped the second person um, as well. So, um, that's, that is, um, that is uh, also um, a significant, uh, a significant point, right? Uh, what is some of that evidence? Because I know in First Enoch, you know, the Son of Man is worthy of worship. In Daniel 7, it seems like a, a lot of the attributes that are usually supposed to only be for, for God or in Canaanite religions right. for, for Baal, you know, coming with the clouds, having an everlasting kingdom and, you know, indestructible dominion, all those are um, attributed the to the Son of Man. Right, and being right. a judge, sitting on the divine throne, like all these things, and and so would that is that some of the evidence you're talking about? That is a great a lot of the evidence. Um, uh, there is a, a certain amount, of, but really marginal evidence of actual worship as well. Mm. But I I don't have it at hand, I'm afraid. Mm. So uh, all right, uh, one one another potentially interesting objection or question is. If a divine Messiah was an established notion within Judaism, then how can you know Mark get away with implying that Jesus was sentenced to death for blasphemy because he identified as that person? Which is, I know, a major question, but yeah, no, but it, but it, it, but it's also it's it's a good question, but it's a relatively easy question. Um, whether or not Jews were expecting and hoping for a divine Messiah does not mean that they, that they expected any given individual human mm. to be able to claim that status, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but uh, within the 20th century, there there was, uh, there was, there is still a significant group of Orthodox Jews, not uh, Jewish Christians or Christian Jews or in any way um, heretical, who believed that that their leader was the Messiah. Um, he died of normal, of natural causes uh, as a, quite an old man. He was a great Jewish leader. And... Um, I can't tell you how many. I didn't do a uh, study, but I know that many Jews of that group um, um, are expecting a return, are re expecting him him to come back, and 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 f perform and fulfill all the functions of the Messiah. Right. So. Uh, in, Um, you know, I once had a conversation with a professor of New Testament at the at a German university, a devout Christian, and he said to me, he said, "Well, Jesus couldn't have called himself the Son of Man." I said, "Why not?" 
He said, because that would be blasphemy. I said, not if it was true. <laughs> so if you really are the Messiah and you call yourself the Messiah, that's not blasphemy. Others might make a mistake and think it is, right? That They think that you're lying, but uh, if, it, if it really is the truth, it's not blasphemy. It's only blasphemy if it's not the truth. And right. clearly the, the high priest um, uh, uh, did not think that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of Man. So when he called himself that or called himself the Messiah or implied that he was the Messiah, they considered it to be, to be blasphemy. Many people across the theological spectrum assert things like ancient Jews were awaiting a human military ruler to overthrow Gentile powers, as if all ancient Jews were a monolith, and they had no notion of a divine messiah. But, but in light of what you've said about two powers theology and literature such as Daniel and First Enoch, that assumption, because that's really what it is, is misguided. So could you tell us sort of what your thoughts are on that and the implications of what we've been discussing? Yeah. I think it's misguided. That's, that's, that's all. <laughs> um, there are already in the Talmud two opinions expressed by two of the... Um, main leaders of the early Babylonian Jewish community, Rav and Shmuel. Now, Rav holds that the, the whole world will be transformed when the Messiah comes. You know, the, the, the full, the, the, the Gansa Megillah, the whole, the whole thing, lions will lie, lie down with lambs and, and um, you know, it really will be the peaceable valley. Um, and his his partner, uh, a debating partner, and the other great leader of the Babylonian Jews, of, we're talking about the uh, third century, late third century, um, is convinced that the only difference between now and the Messianic era is, as you say, that uh, Israel will be freed of uh, domination um, by Gentile powers. So, so there, there is, um, and you pointed to this, there is disagreement on this very, very basic theological uh, notion, um, going right back to antiquity. The Jews are not a monolith. You know, sometimes people, Good Christians ask me, well, after I say all this, uh, you know, why didn't the Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah? I said, so I say to them, well, who do you think did accept Jesus as the Messiah? <laughs> right? <laughs> was it the Germans? Was it the Navajos? It was, the, it was Jews who accepted him now. Anybody who knows anything about Jews knows that they, it's impossible to imagine them all agreeing about anything. So many Jews did accept Jesus as the Messiah, many Jews did not. Uh, that's, you know, that's, it's, it is still the case today. We have this joke that if there are two Jews, there are three opinions. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, Still on the topic of messianic expectations, but kind of changing lanes a little bit, it is often asserted that ancient Jews had no conception of a Messiah who would suffer and die. But you argue that there was an established tradition within Judaism about a suffering Messiah. This belief right. arose from Midrash on Daniel and a messianic interpretation of Isaiah 53, which is every Christian's favorite, like, prophecy fulfilled thing. But what is the evidence that not just Christians, but ancient non-Christian Jews believed in a suffering Christ? Oh, just simply uh, have a lot of lit, uh, early uh, Jewish literature that, that understands Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, to be the Messiah. 
that's more in favor of that in interpretation than any other interpretation of Isaiah 53. Wow. Um, you know, it's just um, a, a, a great medieval rabbi, uh, Nachmanides, the Ramban, uh, sort of 12th century, I think. Um, I'm not so good on centuries. Um, uh, said that he disagrees, but he conceded that most of the rabbis of the Midrash and the Talmud, uh, whom we call Chazal, or sages, may they uh, uh, may their memory be blessed, uh, thought that Isaiah 53 was about the Messiah. And there were stories in the Talmud of, of the Messiah uh, sick, ailing uh, as a beggar at the gates of Jerusalem, waiting to be called to save the world and, and c completely bandaged up and taking his bandages off and, and replacing them one bandage at a time, as opposed to doing his whole uh, wounds at the same time, so that if God calls him to save the world, he'll be he'll be ready to go. He won't have to say, "Wait, I have to put my bandages back on." So uh, there's it's it's just um, it's just simply a mistake to uh, and a very commonly held mistake, both by Jews and by Christians, to assume that the idea of a, of the a suffering. Uh, Messiah is foreign to uh, non-Christian Jews. Hmm. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in this interpretation, mm. but when I read the New Testament, it seems like Jews of Jesus' day weren't, uh, at least the vast majority, were not expecting a, a suffering Christ. Because Mark 8 has Peter rebuke his rabbi Jesus when Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer, die, and rise. Relatedly, in, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says the word of the cross seems like foolishness to many people. He specifically writes, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews. Do you think this right. could reasonably be considered evidence against the idea that there was an established Jewish messianic expectation of our suffering Christ? Yes, it could be. It could it could be taken that way. Nonetheless, it is simply not the case that certainly that all Jews uh, did not believe in the suffering Messiah because the evidence is right out there. It's right out, and it's actually uh, among the Jewish intellectual leaders that we find it, the, the rabbis that we find this view so well. It was contested, it was contested then, it was contested later, as I said, uh, Nachmanides, who was perhaps one of the two or three greatest Jewish thinkers of the Middle Ages, rejected the idea completely. Uh, but, he, but he himself recognized that it was canonical. So uh, um, the evidence you've cited is is evidence that there certainly was opposition to that idea, or that it was a shocking idea, to um, uh, to to rural Jews in the Galilee. But uh, that's not sufficient to uh, you know. And, and in Mark, in particular, the um, the disciples, the apostles are not so highly regarded for their intellectual capacities. I mean, there's a lot, and they make a lot of mistakes. So that's, that, you know, I don't know exactly what's going on with that, whether it's a representation of, of a Christian Markan community and their struggles with other Jews at, at, at the time. So they, but, uh, it, Whatever it was, right? It, uh, it's it's interesting and it's important uh, evidence, but it's not definitive. One thing that really intrigued me in your book was that you argue Jesus kept kosher. Now, yes. most people, including New Testament scholars, assume Jesus did away with Jewish food regulations, especially because in Mark 7, he appears to declare all foods clean. And you have a different take on this passage. G you say Jesus maintained the commandments of God found in the Torah, 
yet he rebuked mm. the traditions of men found in the Pharisees' oral Torah, and that is that that accounts for much of the disputes he had with other Jews about Torah. So could you tell us more about this issue? Yeah. Mark 7 is unintelligible unless we assume that from the beginning to the end, it is about purity rules, not about kosher rules. Hmm. Right? If you remember, it begins with a question about washing hands. Right? Why did Jews wash their hands before they eat? That has to do with the purity rules. It has nothing to do with kosher rules. Now, there is some overlap in the language of the Torah, you know, between purity and impurity and kosher and, uh, and not kosher, but these are a d distinct conceptual uh, issues. Um, kosher and not kosher has to do with the foodstuffs themselves. Pure and impure is something that happens to them. Mm. Now, it, it'll sound paradoxical to Christians, but impure food can absolutely be kosher. Right? Let's say, let's say I have a a, a perfectly perfectly kosher um, eggplant parmigiana that I've made. Right? Eggplants are certainly kosher, tomato sauce is kosher, and it's certainly possible to get kosher mozzarella. Right? So I've made a perfectly kosher eggplant parmigiana. When the temple was extant, if someone who had been in a room with a dead body touched that pot of eggplant parmigiana, or if certain kinds of uh, insects fell on it and then were taken out, that pot of food becomes impure. But that doesn't mean that it's not kosher. That doesn't mean that it can't be eaten. The only people who may not eat impure food are the priests who are serving in the temple. Right? So unless that distinction is made, then um, I, I would argue, I'm not going to go through the whole text now, but I've, I've done it in print, and anybody who wants to can, can see my argument, that uh, Mark 7 only makes sense if what Jesus is talking about there is purity and impurity, not kosher and not kosher, right? And, uh, and uh, uh, the word for that you translated appropriately as make clean Katharizen in Greek means, refers to purity and impurity, not to kosher and not kosher. This distinction... Oh, I'll tell you something ahead. even more shocking. All the food that any Jew eats today is impure. Because mm. we have no... We have no access to the purity system anymore since the temple is destroyed. We can't purify ourselves. So any Jew who's ever been to a funeral or even in a house where somebody passed away or had a, 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 a certain kinds of insects uh, touch him or um, had some kind of a seminal discharge, we're all impure. And when we touch the food, the food becomes impure and we eat it, it's kosher, right? So it is that issue of the purity, impurity, which, which by the way, served as a social exclusion practice because there were, there were a lot of Jews who lorded it over other Jews by saying, we only eat food that's pure. Everybody ate food that was kosher, <laughs> right? And and that's what uh, what Jesus was objecting to: that kind of social differentiation between priests and non-priests, and between uh, those who sort of, um, you know, lorded it over other Jews that they were 
particularly careful about the purity rules. This is key. Otherwise, the text makes no sense. But uh, for that, you have to read my chapter for the details of it. Yeah. Is the distinction between kosher and purity rules, is that just an established a distinction throughout Judaism that Christians yes, and uh, Christ followers such as myself just have no idea about? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely established. And as I say, there's a little bit of overlap in terminology in the Torah. Right. The word tamay, which means impure, sometimes refers to, you know, pigs or certain animals that we don't eat. But generally, the distinction uh, between uh, food that is asur, that we're not allowed to eat, and food that is impure is maintained, and it, they really belong to two separate conceptual systems with whole sets of rules about each one that are distinct from, from the other. You know, it's one, one of the reasons why at least New Testament scholars should really become well-versed in, in the rabbinic texts, and more and more are, I want to say, in every... Uh, you know, uh, I meet New Testament scholars who are really, really good uh, uh, Talmudists, uh, more and more Christian New Testament scholars, whereas 20 or 30 years ago, there were hardly any who would. They, they, everything they needed to know about Judaism, they knew about from reading Martin Luther. Right? It's different now. Apart from this example, yeah, yeah, for sure. Apart from this example about what is pure and clean, there are many instances where we get a glimpse into Jesus' relationship to the Torah. For example, through his wisdom style teachings and eschatological prophecies, he constantly references the Torah. There are also disputes between Jesus and other Jews about what is permissible on the Sabbath. Although I should note for my Christian audience, never about whether or not to keep Sabbath. It's always about what is permissible to do on Sabbath. So keeping Sabbath is just a given. Um, moreover, with the antitheses of Matthew, which are fascinating, he appears to intensify some commands, for example, about sexual purity and murder, while reversing others, about, so, for example, about retributive justice and about swearing oaths. So it seems as though Jesus referenced, reversed, and reaffirmed the Torah, yet it seems like he also, at times, relaxed, reversed, and rebuked things in the Torah. So, I've considered so, thinking of right, Jesus as a semi... Uh, right, I'm sorry? But the rabbis did that also. I mean, one of the favorite examples that people give is Jesus' great statement that the, the Torah, uh, that the Sabbath was created for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. But we find exactly the same idea in in nearly contemporary rabbinic texts, right? There is never, a, 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 or I should say it differently, there are very, very, very clear statements all through rabbinic texts that if somebody is in uh, uh, sick to the point of being in danger, we have to violate the Sabbath. We, you know we call the ambulance, we, we drive, uh, or, or, or whatever it is, you know, any, any medical intervention um, is permitted because, and, and even the, the, if not the exact words, but the notion of the uh, Sabbath being created for the sake of humans and not humans to worship the Sabbath uh, is, is extant in rabbinic literature is also. Right now, I, I've seen, I saw at least one scholar whose name I won't mention, a Christian scholar, who said, well, yeah, but in the rabbinic literature, that's only for Jews. In other words, you should save Jews, but not others. First of all, it doesn't say that. It's not the case. And secondly, the idea, nonetheless, is, is, very, uh, is very clear that uh, for the sake of uh, saving life, 
um, the Sabbath is abrogated. So again, the details, as you said, as you pointed out, you know, Jesus gets into controversy with other, with other Jewish teachers. But again, that just proves he's Jewish. Right, right. His, what we might think, what a number of Christians might think of, of Jesus, kind of nullifying or fulfilling, as we as we like to say, the Old Testament. That these things don't place him outside, uh, outside Judaism. The, all these disputes are intra-Jewish disputes. That, but that is I was my curious. Claim. Right, yeah. right. And I and I was curious. He he definitely reveres. Um, and 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 observes the Torah, but because it seems like he relaxes it, and and especially I'm thinking of the antitheses w- about retributive justice, um, where he you know he responds to an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, because in Deuteronomy, I think 19, where it originally says that, mm-hmm. the motivation is to purge Israel of evil, um, so that Israel might hear about it, fear and obey. Um, and, and be pure, you know, a, a, in a distinctive sort of way. And it seems like Jesus is kind of getting at the root of the command, not just eye for eye, but the motivation behind it by saying, turn the other cheek. And, and, and also with swearing oaths. He says anything more than a yes or no is of the devil when in the Torah swearing oaths is, is permitted, although I'm not sure if it's commanded. So I've considered thinking of Jesus as a semi-liberal but Dr. Dale Allison has warned me that, that that might be too hasty a label. So I was wondering what your thoughts are about Jesus' perspective on Torah yeah. in general. Well, you know, I, I'm not very fond of liberals. Uh, I like radicals. <laughs> so liberals sound like neoliberalism. And it, sound, uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, Nothing much going on. Um, But what I will say, for instance, just to take uh, the first example you made, the the rabbis of Jesus' time, or slightly after his time, were very troubled by an eye for an eye. Hmm. They were very troubled by that. And they insisted that it was not meant literally, that it meant the value of an eye for an eye. In other words, uh, uh, that they claimed that it had never meant, literally, that if, if someone, uh, God forbid, uh, uh, destroys the eye of another person, that we go and destroy it. But, but he has to compensate. They have to compensate for uh, five things, uh, pain, uh, the cost of healing, loss of income, um, uh, embarrassment. Uh, well, I'm forgetting what the fifth is right now. Uh, but so, uh, uh, so, so in that sense, also Jesus was in tune with, with uh, issues that were, as I say, just as troubling for his contemporary uh, Jews, who might have had different solutions. The Pharisees might have had one solution. The Sadducees might have had another solution. Um, it's, uh, I, I do agree that nobody was quite saying, turn the other cheek. That seems to be mm-hmm. unique. Uh, and, I, and I don't deny that Jesus had a important and new messages. That's not my point. Of course, he was a great teacher, as well as being, for many Jews at the time, uh, the Son of Man um, and um, a, a divine figure and redeemer and the Messiah. Uh, so that, that I'm, I'm certainly not claiming that everything that Jesus says or much of what he says is derivative or not uh special or not it doesn't have anything to teach us god forbid that's not what i'm saying at all but i'm saying he was very much in the context of matters that were current uh, among jews and in the jewish world 
um, at the time. By the way, I mean the the the, the statement uh, that we don't take the that verse literally, uh, an eye for an eye, a life for a life, um, was quite a radical loosening up on the part of the the rabbis as well. From that point of view, it's certainly not uh, uh, literal, right? I wish that uh, that uh, as a society we paid more attention to that now and uh, and stop taking lives um, un uh, under a kind of uh, the judicial murder called capital punishment. That's mm -hmm. just my own opinion. Yeah. As a sort of tradition on this channel, for the brief conclusion of each video, I ask three sort of more personal questions. One, right. the first one would just be, what's a significant thing you've changed your mind on, whether from personal conversations or experiences, scholarly discussions or debates, or your own studies? I'd say the most important thing that I've changed my mind about was Zionism. When I was young, in my in my twenties, even in, in, into my thirties, I uh, I was a Zionist, um, and I thought that that was the best thing for the Jews was to have to have the state. To the point that I, together with my wife, we picked up our family and went to live there. Lived there for uh, over a decade. Um, when I saw um, when I saw Yitzhak Rabin's response to the Intifada to children throwing stones, when he said break their arms and their legs, I I said, since I have never held that ends justify means, um, I said, I can I cannot uh, I cannot call myself a Zionist anymore. And that conviction, my anti-Zionist convictions have only deepened and uh, over, the, over the years since that enormous uh, change. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the, the biggest uh, change of mind, I think, in my, in my life. Perhaps um, what, what about something, what's something you've changed your mind on with respect to sort of your studies, whether on Hebrew literature or on the sort of the relationship between Christianity and Judaism? Um, hmm. it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I, my mind is changing all the time. On, and, you know, uh, I've been thinking about certain questions for over 50 years now. And uh, what I say now is very different from what I said 50 years ago. But it's, but it's part of an, you know, a, I'm doing a thing like this, and, you know, an ongoing set of movement, not a, uh, uh, not a, um, some kind of a conversion experience. Fifty years ago, I thought, or probably forty years ago, I, I thought that the big difference in response to the Bible between uh, Jews and Christians had to do with um, the idea that the, uh, that uh, Christian dogmatics hold that the Bible, uh, the Torah, has two two layers the you know the physical layer of the words and and the spiritual uh layer um and that the uh, that jews rejected that notion until the middle ages uh, now i now i think differently now i think it, it, it has to do with uh, theological and not um, ontological differences hmm. that the rabbis really think that we don't know and cannot know very much about God and and that we cannot know 
how to interpret texts and uh, the practices that they engage in are involve a rejection of um, a rejection of both theology and um, interpretation. Um, so that's that's uh, that's what I'm writing about right now. Uh, is is uh, um, that issue? Yeah. Um, now, what's what's a more personal factor that influences your worldview, sort of how you see reality? Um, that that maybe doesn't constitute like technical propositional evidence. Yeah, that's an interesting question too. I would think that the community of people that I'm among, mm. you know, uh, when I taught in Israel, uh, which is now over 30 years ago, I taught in a religious university, an Orthodox Jewish university. Um, my students were all male. Um, so I didn't think all that much about feminism. It's not that I was opposed to it or rejected it, but it didn't. Uh, when I came to teach at Berkeley 34 years ago, and I suddenly had women in my classes, and, um, and I would be teaching a text and all of a sudden realize, hey, I'm not comfortable teaching this text, not because of uh, prudery or anything like that, but because of of, of, of the uh, uh, male androcentric or male chauvinist or sometimes even misogynist aspect of the text, uh, that had a profound effect on me. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, especially as I got to have uh, queer students uh, later on, my, uh, it's, my, personal orientation shifted in, because I couldn't ignore what what seemed to me to be the moral and ethical challenges of, um, of taking seriously the claims of marginalized uh, marginalized uh, people and there are other examples, but I think that's sufficient to, to give a sense. So, so where I am, the community I'm with, um, the people I see every day, the people I teach, has uh, been a kind of uh, profoundly um, mind-changing um, influence on me. Hmm. I appreciate that. Um, to end it off, do you have any final remarks, advice for me or other truth seekers in the audience or recommendations? Well, I'll tell you something. If you come to Berkeley, I'll come out of retirement to be your teacher. <laughs> wow. So it's, it's really been a pleasure, a uh, pleasure to, to, to get to know uh, you and a young person who thinks so seriously and so clearly about things. So my, my final thoughts are just smiles. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll smile as well. Um, for our audience, I hope you've been intrigued and challenged. And to Dr. Boyarin, thank you so much for your time. I won't take any more of it. Peace. Peace.